Thank you very much for staying to the end of this. I know I'm what's between you and a party. I'm going to try to make it an entertaining hour by telling you some creepy things. So I am sometimes known as Dr. Creepy because I wrote a book called Techno Creep. And in it, I identified lots of things that were creepy. One of them, of course, is passwords. And we all know that passwords are vital. But they didn't used to be vital. There was a time, in fact, when our passwords were very different from the way they are now. So one of the possibilities to have for a password is to just own the computer. So if you have physical, I just have, a, I'm having a physical problem here. Okay, I guess I'm supposed to tell you what you're going to learn. You're going to learn why biometrics are about to become very important if you didn't know that already. You're going to know how it's going to have some subtle consequences. So what I like to do is think about the what ifs, how things that might happen and might play out. You're going to hear about some creepy biometric ideas that made my skin crawl. I'll try to get you ready for the biometric revolution. And we have to start by saying, what are biometrics the solution to? And as I was suggesting just now, passwords used to be unnecessary. That was my first computer. That is the IBM 1620 at the Bronx High School of Science in New York. And in the 1960s, that was pretty unusual to have a computer in a high school. My school was a, a special magnet school, and I have to tell you that two of my classmates have gone on to a certain amount of distinction. They both have Nobel Prizes in physics. So you are looking at the runt of the class of 1966. I am the guy who went into computers and computer security instead. But it's fun, and the IBM 1620 didn't need a password because you own the whole machine. You went out there and you just took the thing and signed it up for half an hour and ran your program, and then the next guy cleared the memory. Well, even that started to break down. They brought in this thing called a disk drive, and it had two million characters of storage, which was huge back then, and that thing allowed you to keep files around. And all of a sudden, once you were able to do that, one guy could mess up another girl's files and it would just go on and on like that. So of course now we need passwords and passwords have even become the stuff of comedy. So you've probably all heard, it's often told as a blonde joke and I wouldn't tell it that way of course, but comedian Nick Helm said, I needed a password, eight. they told me it should be eight characters so I picked Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And then there's this wonderful dialogue that's been on the internet. Please enter a new password, cabbage. Sorry, the password must be more than eight characters. Boiled cabbage. Sorry, the password must contain one number. One boiled carriage. Sorry, the password cannot have blank spaces. Um, much time passes and finally he goes, uh, I am now getting really peed off. 50 effing boiled cabbages shoved up your bleep, bleep, bleep if you don't give me access immediately. And of course the punchline is, sorry that password is in use already. So this just indicates the level of frustration that Joe Public has about passwords. And I know there are solutions. There's one password, password managers and things like that. But the reality is a lot of people are saying the password is just permanently broken. We need something else. So what could that something else be? A lot of people say biometrics. Okay, well, there are cartoons about it too. So XKCD, which if you're not familiar with it, you should be, has uh, a couple of things there about passwords. I'll just let you have a look at them. You know, one of them, my favorite is this laptop's encrypted. Let's build a multi-million dollar cluster to crack it. No good, it's 4096-bit RSA. Oh no, drat. What actually would happen is that his laptop's encrypted. Here, hit him with this $5 wrench until he tells you the password. And if you think this is totally trivial, I'll give you a little technical aside. I know a guy who's thinking of using the new Apple devices that are extremely secure. They have a baked in number. This is the new iPad, the new iPhone. That's so good that even Apple cannot find that number. It's sealed into the machine. And my friend is suggesting, hey, we'll use this to control pipelines and we'll use this to control power plants because it's so secure as long as you don't let your children put iTunes on it or something like that. And I said, Terry, that's a wonderful idea, but it's just going to turn into the scenario where somebody puts a gun to the head of the operator and says, type in your password. Because if somebody is willing to blow up a nuclear power plant, they're not going to care if they put a gun to the head of some operator. So sometimes we trade technical risk for human risk, and that would be an example of that. Okay, there is certainly stupidity in the world, so there was recently a study on um, 
password choices and the fact that the most common password is password and one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And also, as we know, there's wholesale catching of passwords. So Russian hackers reputed to catch 1.2 billion passwords. So even if you do everything right, if you pick the best password in the world with all the different characters in the, you know, every alphabet, you're still going to have a problem, which is that the password file has to live somewhere. So all this leads to the idea of biometrics, which is measuring something about your body. It is poised for a huge growth. A company that tracks the industry says the global market will grow to $15 billion by 2015, and that's from 2012 value of $7 billion. And it's moving for, into every sector. So healthcare, doctors are starting to use, you know, handprint IDs to access medical files, certainly in banking, and we've seen all kinds of applications. Biometrics are going to rule the world for a lot of very good reasons. One is that they're so convenient. You're not going to forget your hand. You're not going to forget your iris. You've always got them with you, and they're right there and available. The technology is getting better, and they're more difficult to copy than passwords. People don't think about that much, but if my password is written down on my desk drawer or something like that, somebody can make a copy. To copy my fingerprint, yes, it can be done. They have to drug me first. They have to take a plastic strip and get my finger. They have to put it on a plastic finger. They might have to give it a pulse and so on. So it's a lot more work to copy somebody's biometrics. Biometrics are difficult to share. One of the biggest problems we have in the security industry is, I need this favor. Okay, tell me your password. Okay, my password is. So that type of scenario is a little hard if you have to cut your finger off and give it to your coworker. That's not, it's just not gonna happen. There is some attention being paid to privacy. So for example, I suspect you all know when a finger scan is done, they don't actually capture your whole fingerprint. They capture some points of interest on it, enough to make a number, a hash, and that hash then is used as the number that's represented. And there are legal and financial pressures for non-repudiatable ID. So what is that? That's just ID that says, hey, I did that, and I can't deny that I did that. In the United States in October, a new policy will come into place with credit cards. And I know because I made a purchase at the wonderful bookstore here today, and I said to Doug, the guy who runs it, where's your chip and pin reader? I'm from Canada. We've been using chip and pin for a long time, even though we know that it's somewhat broken and has its problems. And in the United States, once October 1st comes around, if Doug doesn't have a pin on there and my credit card is stolen, he loses the money because the new policy of the card issue is, is going to be merchant liability. So they're pushing us to some kind of ID that is non-repudiatable. We had a very famous case in Canada, you may have heard, a guy bought a car in Toronto, $88,000, so he had a pretty heavy credit card to do that. He'd be very welcome here in Las Vegas. And what happened was he denied it. And the bank, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce said, you, your PIN number was entered. You must have done it. And he said, nah, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And so bottom line, I actually uh, do some journalism, so I worked that story, and I called the bank, and they said, we can't really discuss this case, but we know this man, and we know some things about him. So maybe it's not the simple story that we were thinking where somebody's PIN number was entered by a fraudster and he's now out $88,000 plus interest that was growing every month. Well, I just got word last week that this gentleman has been arrested in Brazil, so apparently he does have some larcenous tendencies. Biometrics are going to creep people out. As I said, I spend a lot of time worrying about how things can be creepy, and it's just so you. It, you can't change your fingerprint. You can't change your retinal scan. It's an intrinsic part of you. The Snowden revelations have sensitized everybody to the fact that lots of government agencies, private companies, and so on are making extensive use of tracking us. And isn't it much worse if they can track us flawlessly, if they can actually know that you are you because of your biometric information? There's a wonderful yarn about Target knowing that a teen girl is pregnant before her dad, and you can look that one up if you want to, but what's even more scary is there are an awful lot of companies out there doing predictive analytics. A piece in the Wall Street Journal this week about how Apple and Google are racing to tell you what you want before you even know you want it. How many of you know about the Amazon Echo? 
Hands up for Echo. Echo is like Siri. It's a personal assistant that you put in your living room, and you can ask it questions. You can go, Alexa, what year did the American Civil War begin? And it will look it up. Alexa, where is there a good pizza parlor that's still open? But the other thing it's been pointed out, it has nine always on microphones just sitting in there waiting for the wake up word. Well, just hypothetically, if the NSA wanted to bug every home in America and didn't have the budget to do that, some people have suggested they would send in this device and it would use voice recognition maybe to figure out who in the family is asking the questions and it could be pretty scary. A, uh, the, a lot of tracking is being done, as you know, by uh, sites like Facebook. There's a real-time auction. If you look at a watch, say on Amazon, and you go on Facebook, you are sold in real time on a system called FBX for the right to present an ad to you. So people just generally have this idea. One of the creepier ones is Mondelez International, which makes Chips Ahoy, Oreo cookies, things like that, are actually introducing smart shelves. <clears throat> These will be shelves with sensors, and as you walk along, they will figure out your gender, your approximate age, your body mass index, and decide whether you should be served up with a coupon, maybe two for one on Oreos today. So there's an awful lot of tracking, and people are getting creeped out by that. So very brief history of biometrics, which I am not going to go through. There's a, as you know, these slides I'm sure are made available, and there's also a white paper in which I've pointed it all out. But you know, pretty important ones is that it goes back 31,000 years because there were some cave paintings found somewhere, and the author had pride of authorship, so he put his handprint on there or her handprint to show that in fact that was the author of the cave painting. Where it gets really interesting, of course, is fingerprints and the fact that the FBI developed in the 1990s their automated fingerprint analysis. So that probably was the landmark in biometrics. The other thing was the TV show CSI. So I got to interview Anthony Zucker, the creator of CSI. I said, is all that stuff they do on television scientifically accurate? And he said, Tom, everything we show is scientifically true but we speed it up for television. Okay, well the FBI speeded things up for television too by automating fingerprint ID. Face recognition was tested at the Super Bowl in Tampa by US government agency and machine readable travel documents are becoming the norm. So there is no question that biometrics is a happening kind of thing. Okay, I am having a slight there. Okay, this is a, a interesting piece of technology. If you are not a US citizen or a Canadian, for example, because the U.S. loves Canada, you will be subjected to something called the U.S. Visit Program. So let's say you're hypothetically an Australian, and this Australian is entering the United States, they will be asked for biometric identification, which means they take a picture of you and they take some fingerprints. Well, I know a person who was going through this, and being an Australian had very quick wit, and she had a Band-Aid on the finger that they wanted to scan. So of course she said, what should I do? And the woman said, take off the Band-Aid. And she said, oh, it might bleed. Oh no, don't bleed on my equipment. No, no, that's, that's a hazmat situation. Don't do that. Well, what should I do? Well, give us another finger. Now what did the Australian say? Will this finger do? Middle finger. To which the US government representative agent said, as long as you give us the same finger when you leave the United States. So the reality is, you know, there, there are some kind of fun aspects to biometrics, but they are indeed being captured. And I want to tell a yarn about an important biometric system in Canada. Why is it important? Because if you come into the Toronto airport at a busy time, you might line up for two hours to go through customs. But if you have this thing called a Nexus card, you get to go right through it. You walk up to a kiosk, you put your card in, and everything is hunky-dory. That's not always true. A certain percentage of time, it's probably about three times out of 100, you'll be sent for a secondary check. That's just to keep you honest and so on. But 97 times out of 100, you're going right through, and you can thumb your nose at all the people standing in the line there. Well, the Nexus things are interesting. And I happened to be at a dinner with the software developers. And I said, you know, you guys solved a very difficult computer science problem. And I am a computer science professor, and I want to praise you. And they said, shut up. I said, what do you mean? They said, don't talk about that. I said, but no, no, really, you, 
You didn't just solve the, here's my Nexus card and here's my eyeballs and I'm the holder of that card, check. You actually solved the problem where I could put my eyeballs in. I didn't even have the card with me sometimes, well, you're supposed to, and they would actually look me up in a database. And they said, yes, that's the way it's supposed to work. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, it doesn't always find one person. I said, well, what happens then? They said, well, we choose the first one on the list. Right? So that led to the interesting possibility of people entering and leaving Canada who never knew that they did and vice versa. So I did ultimately, and I had to investigate, you know, I didn't quite go to Freedom of Information Act, but I had to doggedly pursue the Canadian government. And I said, so what did you do in the case where there wasn't just one person who matched those eyeballs, which is an important part of biometrics, you know, finding out who it is. They said, well, we sent the person in to talk to a, an actual live human being then. So that's how they solved it. The other thing that they did is they surplused all their Nexus terminals. And in fact, they are selling them for something like $125 online. So if you would like your own customs entry terminal, you can just go to GC Surplus, the Canadian government surplus site, and buy one of these things and pick it apart. I have suggested to them that maybe that's a dumb thing to do, that maybe they should put them in a big crusher or something like that, as opposed to trying to recover a couple of hundred dollars from what was at one point secret technology. Okay, so I said I would talk about hidden risk, and one of them is our perception of reliability. So, of course, the deputy minister that these guys didn't want me to shout too loudly in front of, oh, they did a great job, he thinks biometrics is zero or one. You're either identified or you're not identified. The reality is, of course, it's a little bit on a scale. So you probably know that every time Apple brings out a new phone with Touch ID, the Chaos Computer Club in Germany and various other people find ways to duplicate the finger, find ways to hack that thing. But the guy who does that, and this is one of his articles here, goes, why I hacked Touch ID again? This is when the new iPhone 5S came out, and I still think it's awesome. And he makes the very good point that, yeah, there are ways to break this technology, but for the vast majority of the cases, it's an excellent technology. It serves most people's needs, and it's darn convenient. So even the guy who was out there showing the vulnerability, which is what we all do at Black Hat, DEF CON, besides all these conferences, they're also showing that for most people, it's probably a pretty good thing. I'm not going to go into all the technicalities of biometric risk, but there are two kinds of risks. One of them is a type one error, which is a false rejection rate. So you're the doctor who's supposed to get to the medical records and it doesn't let you in. The other is a false acceptance rate, which is you're the person who doesn't have authorized access to the nuclear power plant, but it lets you in anyway. And my point from those examples is it all depends. Which kind of rate do you want? Do you want it to be very strict? and keep out people, even some legitimate people, do you want it to be very loose? And there's no answer to that question. Actually, it depends on the application. There is, however, a crossover point at which the two are equal that's sometimes called neutrality. So without any further information on the situation, people often try to set up these systems so if they're going to have a false acceptance rate, of 3%, it'll be a false rejection rate of 3%. So they kind of tweak it to be somewhere in the middle. The main point is to know that you can't make them zero. There ain't no perfect biometric system. Now, what are people trying in this area? Well, one of the funniest ones is the idea of a digital tattoo. Okay, so that if you're going to go out there and you're going to have a password, why not tattoo it in magnetic ink on your arm? Well, I'll tell you why not. People do not want their employer going around tattooing them. So on the fine uh, business floor here, they're giving out these wonderful tattoo sleeves. And you can imagine if you had a whole sequence, if you were a job hopper and you had 30 different jobs, you'd have a whole sequence of passwords. You know, I love Cisco, I love this company, I love IBM, all up and down your arm. So the whole idea that you have a magnetic ink tattoo seems to me to be the kind of thing that you really want to treat as a last resort. There's actually, and this is a specific patent that I looked up, a magnetic ink tattoo that is also a telephone because built right into that is a microphone. 
So the reality is that one of the things that's happening, all kinds of technology is being invented that's really very, very far out, like a cell phone on your arm. So you talk into your arm. Okay, the actual patent is there, and you can look it up on the white paper if you want. It was assigned to Motorola. Now, Motorola is now part of Google, and Regina Dugan, last time I looked, was running technology, and she is one of the creepier people on the planet, and the reason is she suggested we should take password pills. So every day you would swallow a pill, it would broadcast radio waves from your digestive tract, it would come out the other end tomorrow, and that would be your password. And of course, that's dumb thinking, because how do I steal your password now? Well, you know, I go through your desk drawer looking to see if you wrote it down backwards. Then I maybe torture you with a hammer. Now all I have to do is break into your drawer, grab tomorrow's pill, take it, and I'm you. So my point is that a lot of these things are not thought through. They're cute ideas and they're wonderful, but people haven't really thought through how they would actually work in reality. And in fact, there's some great work at the Polytechnic University of Madrid to identify us by how we smell. Okay, so everybody has a unique body odor. They're up to around an 80% reliability for this thing where in fact they can find you by your body odor. But you know, what if you've just gone on a jog or something like that? Your body odor is going to change. So all these things are worth talking about and worth thinking about. Whether they will be accepted is kind of questionable. There's a company in Canada called NIMI that thinks that your heart rate is your next password. So I know when we all go to work every day, our heart skips a beat at the joy of logging onto our computers, and now they will record the way your heart skips a beat. So your electrocardiogram is a possible digital signature, as are many other bodily functions. Okay, so if it's not your electrocardiogram, maybe your electroencephalogram. There are now consumer devices by companies like NeuroSky and Emotive that read your EEG. So the day may come when you think your password. So there's that wonderful image of, I don't know, the pyramids if you're Egyptian or the, uh, the wonderful beach in Australia or something like that. And you are, in fact, thinking of that. And there's researchers, a guy named Jack Gallant in California, who actually has it down to the point with functional magnetic resonance imaging that he can show you a film and then measure your brain with fMRI and do a reconstruction. And it's not perfect. So maybe you're seeing a film of a subway train and what comes out in your brain looks more like a steam locomotive. And then a woman comes in, but she looks different. The point is that we're near the point of reading the human mind in certain ways. And that would be one way to do it. So your brain may become your password. Now, to research all of this, and that's my book, Techno Creep, I basically have this premise that people have an uneasy feeling about this. And I actually worked out, because I'm a professor and I had to have a chart, I worked out some dimensions of creepiness. And again, they're in the book, they're in my white paper, but a lot of it has to do with, is it mysterious? Okay, so do you understand how it works? So if they did introduce a biometric password, I would certainly suggest that they explain exactly how it works, what its limitations are, and so on. Because if they don't, it becomes that kind of black magic that people become suspicious of. I don't know if any of you remember Girls Around Me, but that was a really creepy app that unified check-ins on the Foursquare with Facebook profiles. So you'd walk into a bar, you would push a button, you would see five girls there, it was only about girls, and the profiles on Facebook, if they were public, came up. So you could walk and go, hi, Sally, uh, I see you're not in a relationship, and uh, hmm, your uh, favorite band is the Bare Naked Ladies. Well, let's have, a, let's have a drink together. And this was called Taking Creepy to a New Level by the New York Times reporter, Nick Bilton. And the reality is it did take Creepy to a new level, and it got kind of shut down pretty quickly. Foursquare cut their data feed, so they weren't able to use it. One of my points about that, though, is that their name was creepy. Girls Around Me just sounds awful. If it was like New Friend Finder or something like that, the naming of the technology may be germane. I have an example in the book called Boyfriend Tracker, which you can put on somebody's phone, and it sends all their messages, turns on the microphone on their phone, and it's being used by girls in Brazil to track their boyfriends. Well, if you called it something like, I left my phone in the taxi tracker, that would be an entirely different thing. So some of the dimensions that I've thought about here are, you know, they sound pretty silly, 
the name of the technology, except that's what people think about. So if you're ever in the position where you're trying to bring in technology, call it Twitter or something like that. Call it something that sounds nice and pretty and not, not offensive. I want to take you on a little bit of a trip here. That's a very famous photograph. It was taken April 19, 2013. It's Shokar Zarnayev, the now convicted Boston Marathon bomber, cowering under a tarp. Okay, and so he was giving off a biometric heat signature there. He was actually detected by a thermal imaging camera flown in a helicopter. So I got that photo from the Massachusetts State Police, and the camera that they took it with was a very high quality camera. But guess what? FLIR, which makes cameras, has brought out a back for the iPhone with a price of $349 that could do the same thing. Now, why do we care about this? Because a lot of technologies are moving to be widely available, like thermal imaging. And here's the security aspect. People have already started using the FLIR back to capture the pin numbers on keypads. If a keypad is made of rubber or plastic, not metal, there is enough heat left in it that you can actually see the last pin number that was typed in. So there's a great video on YouTube where somebody follows a woman into a Target store, just snaps a picture of the keyboard, and then he knows her pin number. Now, of course, then he has to steal her card or something, but, you know, that's, that's details. In Canada, we're so peace-loving that I had to put another slide in, but I thought I'd show it to you as well because they go, well, nobody would steal my card. You know, we're Canadians. We're friendly. Well, what if you have a eight-year-old latchkey child who comes home every day and you have your door locked with one of these locks? Well, guess what? The thermal imaging camera can rat you out there. Now, this is a project one of my colleagues did at the University of Calgary where he flew with this thermal camera and our houses are giving off biometrics too. They're giving off the heat that they send out and he codes your house based on how much energy you're wasting. And I said, Jeffrey, you've put this up on a public web page. Did it ever occur to you that it might be misused? He said, no, no, it's for homeowners to look at their houses. I said, Jeffrey, what if there was an eco-terrorist group and they wanted to find the energy wasters and pick at their houses? Or maybe there's a police organization that wants to look for houses that emit a lot of energy. And he said, well, we have a solution to that. If somebody's worried about their information getting out, we omit their house and we put up privacy concerns. And we just omit it. And I said, Jeffrey, that's a bit like saying, here's what my basement looks like. This is a real marijuana grow up, uh, RCMP photo from Maple Creek, British Columbia. In other words, you're giving out that information. And in the book, I quoted him saying, uh, how many, I asked him how many people have asked for privacy, and he said, oh, nobody's asked for it. And there's a very good reason. Okay, there's a little bit of an interesting legal twist I'll just quickly tell you about. There was a great case in the United States Supreme Court in 2001, the case Kylo versus United States. This guy was busted with a grow up, so again, he was emitting heat. The police used a thermal imaging camera. His very smart defense lawyer said, hey, that's an illegal search under the Fourth Amendment. And the cop said, no, no, we just use this camera. You can only use technology that's commonly available. You can use a regular Kodak camera, you can use a, uh, uh, binoculars, but you can't use this $60,000 thing. Well, think about it, now the $60,000 thing is $349. So if this case went back up to the Supreme Court, they ruled in favor of the guy, he was acquitted, it would have gone the other way. They would have actually convicted him, I think. So what I predicted, in my book about kind of the future is that we're going to have a situation where you walk into a store like Target and you type your PIN number in, we'll still have PIN numbers, but immediately the PIN pad will be swept away. And in case you haven't seen one, there are toilets that do that. I always wanted to show a toilet seat at a major conference. This is a special toilet seat where you get a fresh one every time. So why would they take the PIN pad away because they can now analyze your DNA, not in real time, but nearly real time, using a system called touch DNA. So there actually is a system that's available, and the small amount of data that you left on that pin pad, that biometric data of yours, could be used to get your DNA. And what does that say? Well, it says what diseases you're prone to, what uh, your heredity, your ancestry, 
It also says things about your blood relations. So your siblings, your mother, your father. So I predict you'll come into Target a week later and up on the screen you'll see a display that says, did you know that you're pre-diabetic? Here's a 30% off coupon on our special pre-diabetic diet for you. Do we want that? Do we really want Target to have our DNA? I'm suggesting no. I'm not a lawyer. Disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I don't think there would be anything preventing them from doing that. They'd probably have to put up a sign that says, when you use this, we're collecting your DNA. But, you know, go watch in Target or Walmart. How many people would even read that sign? How many people would understand it? How many people would care? You would, because you're here and you're technologically savvy, so you need to help explain it to people what it means. And so the reality is, yeah, access to your DNA is going to provide all kinds of information about you, and there's even another level, which is called epigenetics. So your DNA isn't totally fixed. Your DNA can be methylated, and other transformations can occur based on the environment. And all of this can be measured just from a few skin cells. If you think I'm making this up, Madonna has a staff member who goes around every time she drinks from a water glass and either takes it away or cleans it, sterilizes it, so that nobody has Madonna's baby without her authorization. Okay, should you care about your DNA getting out there? Well, this is a wonderful set of examples. One of them is the Who's Your Daddy truck, which cruises around the streets of New York. A guy named Jared set up a mobile DNA testing service, and he's actually now got a reality TV show called Tales of the Swab. And he basically goes out there and he shares stories from his DNA truck. So if you ever wondered who your daddy was, that's a very simple way to do it. There's also a great case of a young man who found out he was fathered by sperm donation. Now I won't ask if you put yourself through college doing that, but if you did, you were probably told it's totally anonymous. Well, guess what? This kid found his father without the father ever giving up his DNA just by using his own DNA and some circumstantial evidence where the father went to school and so on. And of course, you could have a lot of kids coming out there asking, to, uh, asking you to help. In the, a chapter in the book, I write about sperm donation. I think the record is 589 children from the same father. And they actually have a club. And they go on picnics together. And it looks really weird because they all look alike. Hundreds of kids who look alike. Hidden risk number three, biometric data is irreversible. Once you give it out, you ain't going to get it back. Even a small sample of your DNA is a possibility that they can grab all the information. And the legal protection of this is very variable. As you might expect, California had the first sort of DNA storage law, but it varies quite a bit. So if, the way I like to explain it, if it's dynamite for a company to have your credit card number, because they might, in fact, be sued because they lost your credit card number, think of what would happen if they had your DNA. Okay? If a company collects your DNA, they're really dealing with nuclear fuel there because it could expose them to huge risks. Okay, the newest vulnerability is your face. We all know facial recognition is getting really good. Google has it to within a few tenths of a percent of human ability. In fact, I think in some cases better than humans. And Alexandra Acquisti did a great experiment at Carnegie Mellon he took people's dating site photos and he matched them up with their Facebook profiles. So, you know, when people go on dating sites, they don't put their real name up. They become Sexy Babe 235 or Hung Guy 404 or something like that. And then if they like you, they tell you their real name. Well, in a significant number of cases, just using PitPat, which is a facial recognition program, Alessandro could figure out who Sexy Babe 235 really was. So your face is a vulnerability, and there's even an app called NameTag that looks up that stranger sitting next to you in the bar, and right now the only database it has is the National Register of Sex Offenders, which is interesting. But if it ever got all of Facebook and all of those tag photos on Facebook, you'd have a world where you hold the phone up to somebody and you instantly know all about them, and that's probably coming. Even how we walk is being studied, if you think about 9-11, you probably know that there were cameras in the airports, like in Logan Airport in Boston. And what happened? They immediately started analyzing that footage to see if they could find 
terrorist behavior? Do they walk a certain way? So I never talked about it until The Economist wrote about it in October 2008, but at the Aberdeen uh, Proving Ground in Maryland, the U.S. Army has a whole gate analysis project, and there's a terrorist walk, and I won't show it to you because if you do it in the airport, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Hidden risk number four, our biometrics can be uh, grabbed without our consent. The whole idea of the touch DNA is one example, but you walk out on the street, your face is in the public, your gait is public, your speech. There's a company called IntelliStreets that has street lamps that watch you and that analyze you, and that they also play music and do things like that. Okay, in fact, there they are. Those are the IntelliStreets street lights uh, which are creeping out, and there is a, an array of surveillance cameras being installed in the BART system in San Francisco. So the hardware is moving pretty quickly to grab this data. The question is, what do we do on the back end? Okay, at DEF CON a few years ago, a few guys presented, and they were you know, great young presenters, on how this system that U.S. Homeland Security thought would be really good actually would be really bad. It attempted to find terrorists by physiological parameters, heart rate, sweating, and so on. And what happened is Semen Rechikov stood up and presented while his partner ran around the room three times, nearly killed him, and at the end of it, they took his heart rate, and of course he would have shown up as being highly suspicious. So the point is that biometrics can lead to wrong conclusions. Okay, there is a company, I won't tell you a lot about them, but they're called Photon X, and they can do things like read your fingerprints at a distance of five feet. So they have a whole 3D modeling and profiling technology that is very, very sophisticated. The DARPA, who of course gave us the internet, is also making some interesting use of memory. They had a project which, to put it bluntly, had to do with implanting false memories. Okay, so they, they were studying how narrative is used, and there is actually research with rats that say you can give the rat a false memory. There are rats that are afraid to walk across a certain metal plate in the floor, even though they never had a shock from it, because they inherited the fear from their grandfathers. Risk number six. Giving our biometric and behavioral data may become de facto mandatory. This is a pretty interesting concept. It is true that you can rent a car without a credit card. Go and try to do that, okay? You have to bring a lot of cash and your mother's birth certificate and a whole bunch of other stuff. So you need a credit card to rent a car. Well, down in Walt Disney World now, there's a thing called the My Magic Wristband. And if you get one, it's your pass into the park and it also gets you on rides and so on and it tracks every move you make. They know every way you stopped. They know when you went to the bathroom, which bathroom you went into. They have spending limits on it. So Minnie Mouse can see your little six-year-old come along and, oh, Sally is coming, and her favorite character is Minnie Mouse, and her remaining spending limit for today is $32. So let's pull out the $29.95 doll of Minnie Mouse. So the reality is you don't need these things. You can go to Disney World and you can say, I just want a paper ticket, and I just want to get in the park with the kids. And they'll go, okay, here's your paper ticket. Go in the park. But you lose all your privileges. So imagine explaining to Sally, oh, well, that, you know, there's an hour-long line for Thunder Mountain, but that family's going ahead because they don't value their privacy. But we value our privacy, so we're going to get heat stroke out here in the sun. Uh, your kids are not going to buy that. So there's a whole concept that we will give into this stuff. Another example is insurance. Progressive has the, the uh, snapshot that allows you to monitor your driving and maybe get a discount. John Hancock Insurance is now allowing you to wear a fitness monitor 24-7, track your exercise, and maybe get a discount on your life insurance. So they've taken the same concept that's used in cars and applied it to the human body. Okay, so there's actually the, the John Hancock monitor, and people are doing this. So what are you giving up? Maybe you get a 5% discount on your life insurance. You're giving up extremely detailed information about your life. In fact, you're giving up information about when you have sex. Now, all presenters were told not to show anything offensive. I hope this is not offensive to you, but your Nike fuel band, and there's, a, I know, a Nike party tonight, your fuel band knows when you're having sex. 
And the reason is, it's got accelerometers, it measures the motion, it's 3.30 in the morning, you just burned 150 calories if you're a typical male, and you took zero steps. The fuel band can come to a conclusion. The fuel band can communicate by Bluetooth to another device, which can call the person you were supposed to be in bed with. So the devices that are in fact coming up around us to help us to measure our biometrics can also be the ones that take us down. There are workplace issues. Companies, some companies are actually giving fitness monitors to employees to encourage fitness, which is great, telling them to wear them 24-7. So again, you know, they know when they had sex, but they also know things like how much sleep they got. Now, if you're an aircraft pilot and you show up having had sex all night and no sleep at all, you know, maybe you shouldn't fly the plane. If you're a checkout person at Walmart, maybe you can do that job in your sleep anyway. So the reality is the, the business will know things about your life outside of the business if you wear this tracker. The other thing is that if you happen to have it on, let's say that you're in an advanced business negotiation, so you're having a meeting with your boss, and I think, I think the boss is kind of slow to come up here, and in that meeting, your boss has access to your fitness monitor. So as you are carrying on the conversation with your boss, looking into each other's eyes, we won't say who's the boss and who's the employee, if one of those persons knows the other person's pulse is elevated and they're perspiring and so on, they might know that they're bluffing. There's all kinds of possibilities for the misuse of that kind of information. So the workplace is gonna be a, a fertile field for this. Then there are thieves. People steal data, they steal passwords. I told you that at the beginning. They steal health data. Why wouldn't they steal biometric data? Of course they will. Even the legal ones could be a problem. There are companies, a famous one used to be ChoicePoint, that just accumulated data on people. So everything that they could, your financial records, your health records, anything that they could get, they would build files on you. Well, they'll go after your biometric information if they're allowed to do that as well. So data aggregators may own you in the sense of owning your biometrics. So what's a framework? I'm, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a takeaway here and then maybe have a little bit of time for questions. Even before you get back to your office, you should think about biometrics. Are there any of these that you're using already that maybe might cause you problems down the line? Apply that creepy lens. If you get my book and you know it's on Amazon and everything, you can get the diagram where you can probably find it online now and look at those different dimensions. And you may come up with other dimensions of creepiness too. And think about alternatives. So with that fitness tracking thing, an alternative would be a sign-in sheet at the company gym. Right? So if the company provides like Google an on-premises gym, you don't have to know exactly how somebody worked out you just know they went to the gym for an hour. And if they didn't work out well, that's kind of not that important. So maybe there's pretty good data that's maybe not as invasive. Longer term applications, think about your data retention policies. So we often see, for example, videotapes that are kept forever, video surveillance. Good practice, I'm told, is if you haven't needed them in seven days, you probably should get rid of them. They are a liability, not an asset. Consider whether some data should be de-identified. So if you're collecting certain biometric data, you might want to de-identify it. But I can tell you that there are de-anonymizing techniques that can counteract some de-identification. And look at every technology through this creepy lens. So if you go out and buy something, think about the fact that it can be used against you. So again, thank you very much. If we have a little bit of time for questions, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I guess if you have a question, just shout it out, or maybe there are microphones out there I didn't know. Yes? The mics are not on. Can we have sound and power there? Make All right, this one seems to work. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for this. Um, one of the things, I'm in, I, I work in policy, which means I talk to people who make laws all the day uh, about stuff like this. and. One of the things I tend to talk about is spoofability, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, for example, um, two things that you didn't talk about: um, uh, vocal pattern analysis, you know, sort of speech recognition yes. stuff, and and um, vein patterns in your hand. You know, th those are two things that I've heard people say 
are still extremely challenging to spoof yes. or steal or reproduce, whereas you know, we see like Mark Rogers you know, with a YouTube video showing you how easy it is to reproduce a fingerprint yes. and, and, and facial stuff replaying, and you have like, um, what was the, there was a, I think PayPal or someone is going to allow you to, or Visa or someone is going to allow you to pay for stuff by taking a selfie and blinking one eye or something yep. as yep. a challenge. And I was wondering what you, uh, any thoughts about so, so the Excellent question. You probably noticed my voice has changed from the beginning to now. Okay, I became hoarser. So I might, depending on where the type 1 and type 2 error thresholds are set, I might fail a vocal recognition test. Now, I know Air Canada, for example, with their aeroplan system, has you say your number. And there's probably not terrible consequences to, you know, letting somebody in there. So, again, it comes down to where you set those thresholds. But vocal recognition, it's, it's in there kind of with, I did some work in the 1980s on typing pattern recognition. And it turns out that, I could tell. I, I built some software so if a different person, somebody hit you on the head and they went and started typing at your computer, I could detect that change. I couldn't figure out with any great accuracy who was typing or if there were 20 people in the office, which one it was. And the other thing is if you type a password, let's say, it, we tell people to have long passwords, complicated passwords. Those are the ones that it's hardest to reproduce your typing rhythm. Simple word that you know is fine. Big, long, complicated one, you stumble and so on. So there's that whole class of biometrics I didn't talk about that are just kind of borderline. Okay, the vein pattern probably falls into that as well. I think these things will get better. The, the important point I want to make is we always have to think about the consequences. So if you're going to use something that is crucial, access to a nuclear power plant, it should be three factors, five factors, whatever, provided, you know, you, there's no bad consequence to keeping the guy locked out. So you always have to weigh the, the type 1 and type 2 errors. The countervailing thing is convenience, though. I mean, as you said, PayPal wants to use a selfie, uh, bought a new laptop computer, and it lets you log on with your smiling face. So people are going to opt for convenience, and there will be consequences. Any other questions? Right yes, sing so, it out. So I was just thinking, it took us 20 to 30 years to get to this state of the red and mouse, uh, mouse and cat game on passwords and things like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of hacking now, biometrics. So there is a growing field of biotechnology and therefore biohacking. You know, whether it be brain images being transplanted and influence or um, changing the way you perspire, yes. and location, emulation, and so on. So can you speak a little bit about what is happening in terms of biohacking that will eventually be able to emulate one human being Yes. Like another, and also break whatever these okay. technology, which we call hashes, but it's really us here, right? At the that, end of the that's day. a wonderful yeah. question because A, there's going to be a biohacking village at DEF CON for the first time. As if you haven't been to DEF CON, there are, there's a lock picking village, right? We can learn to pick locks. There's a Wi Fi hacking village. For the first time this year, there's a biohacking village. And I, you know, I kind of helped with the people who started. I didn't do a lot of the work, but it was inspired by the fact that I saw a guy speak at the Hackers on Planet Earth conference in New York. He was like a 20-year-old graduate student, and I realized the same thing that happened in the 1980s when computers went from costing $5 million to $500 is happening with biotechnology because a lot of university labs and drug company labs are selling their old gear off on eBay. So I asked this kid from McGill, how did you get the equipment to do DNA synthesis and make a new organism? You know, I bought it on eBay for $300. So as that technology moves, we're going to see exactly the same thing that we saw with computer hacking. And I said to this fellow, don't you worry, something bad will happen. He said, oh, no, I'm very ethical. I said, you're ethical and you also weigh about 94 pounds. Someone could pick you up and carry you away and torture you and make you do bad things with your knowledge. So it's pretty well unregulated. If we do bio research at a university, there's 14 different forms to fill out and a safety officer. If we do it in our basement, not so much. So to answer your question, there is certainly the possibility that somebody will find a way to grow a finger that has a certain fingerprint or to spoof the DNA testing. There's, um, as you know here at Black Hat, spoofing satellites. If you can spoof a satellite electronically, very soon we'll be able to do the same thing in biology. And you know, to follow Ray Kurzweil's lead, 
things are going to go exponentially. So we say now, yeah, well, that's, that's pretty far-fetched. Well, two years from now, it's less far-fetched than three years from now it's happening. So everything you said is true. I think we need to worry about biohacking. Is there a question there? Yes, please. We're well into our second decade of parents doing neonatal testing, neonatal DNA testing for mm -hmm. children. So those kids are starting to reach age of majority and the consent situation changes radically. Can you speak about what we can expect oh uh, coming up on that? I, I had an epiphany while I was researching the book, which is that when we were all born, they took some blood from our heel and they tested that for certain inborn errors of metabolism like PKU. You can look this up if you're not familiar with it. And if they catch that soon after a, body, a baby is born, they can administer drugs to correct it. But it occurred to me that all over the place, there are samples of our blood, which is basically our DNA. They can get DNA from the pharaohs, you know, mummies. Why can't they get it from that? And then I looked into that more, and there actually have been lawsuits in Texas, notably, where whole treasure troves of DNA records or blood, they're called heel stick records, have been destroyed by court order because people are concerned about their children's privacy being invaded. To separate the Canadian side from the American side, there was a survey in Canada that said, do you consider it creepy that we might have your blood sample, your child's blood sample? And Canadians said, as long as you don't misuse it, that's fine. So the Canadians were, came down on the side of, yeah, go ahead. The Americans came down on the side of, we're going to sue you. We're going to take you to court. Now, did you have a more specific question there? Not really. It, it's interesting you mentioned PKU. I was, um, back when I was a reporter covering this stuff instead of a security practitioner covering mm -hmm. this stuff, um, I talked to a legislator who had been a nurse and was very concerned about getting all children in the state in which I live tested for PKU you know, at birth, because, you know, she had some very specific uh, benefits to that, obviously, and she had not at all considered the privacy implications, and I know that there was no mechanism, I said, will there be a mechanism at age 18 where they can pull their records, and I, she looked at me like I'd fallen out of the moon. So I was just curious, yeah. you know, that's been a bit, so I'm curious as to whether we've evolved any thinking at the legislative level that's worth talking about on that front. Yeah, and, and the answer is it's going to be a policy, and I guess in the U.S. there'll be 51 policies, right? One for each state and a federal one as well. And, you know, that's one of the advantages we have in Canada, that we do tend to have unified policies. Frankly, we normally copy yours on a lot of things. But I think this is something we did have a big... Uh, controversy with the Huntington Society of Canada. And I take the task in the book because they ran commercials that said, getting tested puts you at risk. And you have to understand Huntington's is a disease that if you have the ge genetics for it, you will get it. And you will get it probably by the age of 35 and you will die a slow death and it's incurable. So there's ethical questions about should you tell a 10 year old child you're gonna die that way? Should, no, maybe not because it might be fixed by then. The other possibility is, you know, does the testing actually put you at risk? We don't have a Genetic Non-Discrimination Act in Canada. You do. You have GINA in the U.S. And so the society was pushing for that. And we should have that law. <laughs> My quarrel with them is that put, getting tested doesn't put you at risk. What happens with the results? You can get the test and never look at it, never look at it till the child is 21. But you certainly don't want to share it with anybody. And you certainly don't want to share it with the government. And by the way, if you're going to send in your DNA to 23andMe, make sure you do it anonymously or in the name of your dog and your cat. And we did that and we got confused in the family about which pet was which person, which was pretty funny. We had some, some funny, uh, hysterical actually, uh, genetic testing results. But if you give away your DNA, I would never give away my DNA in a way that was tagged. And of course, I tried an experiment. I called 23andMe and I said, oh, I've lost the password for the account. What do I need to do? And they said, you have to fax us government-issued ID, a passport or a driver's license, which of course would defeat the whole purpose of being anonymous. So if you do your 23andMe test, do it under the name of your pussycat and don't forget the password. Any more questions? Discussion? Rants? How many of you going to DEF CON? You should go to DEF CON. DEF CON's very entertaining. Who, who went to B-Sides? Okay. Yeah, cool, cool. I'm going to do that. I've, I've missed that one. Uh, I've done RSA, I've done DEF CON, I've done this, and, and B-Sides is on my list in the future. On that happy note, 
I just saw a sign that we have five minutes left, which means I'm giving you back five minutes of your life, and that gets you to the party on time. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Please consider getting my book. My, I was tickled to find that's now being sold on walmart.com. That happens to be the cheapest place to get it, and I figured, well, I must have really arrived at the selling my book in Walmart. So thank you very much. <laughs>